Hello, and uh, welcome to today's community webinar from the Green Bank Observatory. I'm Jay Lockman. Uh, Karen O'Neill, our director, is unable to be with us today, but she has prepared slides that I'll go through and answer any questions if I can. And please, if you have questions, use the Q&A box at the bottom of the, uh, of the screen. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, as I say, this is gonna be uh, observatory news that Karen has prepared, and then we'll have a science presentation from Christine Speckens of the Royal Military College of Canada and Queen's University. Okay, next slide. Yeah. First of all, about the status of the observatory. Um, in West Virginia, as you can see, COVID-19 cases are on the rise. Uh, the state has done a very good job of getting vaccinations out. Schools are still back in sessions and universities closed for the semester, but I think that uh, things are certainly looking better uh, from a personal point of view. Lots of people are now getting vaccinated, but the observatory is still running with people remote if, if at all possible. Let's see the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, the GBT has remained in operation 24 hours, seven days a week. All the instruments are in place and site protocols are working. We have no cases of work-related transmission of the virus. Um, we're into high frequency season and the sky right now outside is just beautiful. And I think we'll be working at three millimeters later on today. Um, there's an ice storm coming, but so far we've been lucky. Um, tomorrow, we will be observing the Perseverance entry, descent, and landing onto Mars. And so there's a lot of activities that are going on at the observatory leading up to this. Uh, please look at our website for more information. Okay. Coming up is a conference, a virtual conference celebrating the 20th anniversary of the start of GBT observations. And so we are having a virtual workshop April 21st and 22nd. Uh, there's a draft agenda under development. We'll be discussing some of the history of the telescope, um, some of its accomplishments and where we can look forward in the next 20 years, another 20 years of innovation and discovery. We're having an image contest and we really are soliciting images from data taken with the GBT. You can see more information about this uh, at our website. Okay. Next slide, please. Whoops. Oh, that was the end of the slideshow. Okay, uh, this is just a photograph of the staff. Um, well, let's go on to our science presentation now, and that is by Christine Speckens, um, and she's going to be talking about ultra-diffuse hydrogen in galaxies. And so take it away, Christine. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep my video off during the presentation, and then I can turn it on at the end. Um, so uh, thanks a lot for um, this opportunity to speak to you. Um, so I want to talk about some of the work that my group has been doing to try to understand the physical properties of a class of galaxies called ultra diffuse galaxies using deep H1 follow up observations with the GBT of optically selected candidates. And one of those candidates is shown on the right hand side of this slide. And the idea here is to use the gas reservoirs as probes of their origins. Now, this is work that's been done in collaboration with uh, Dennis Sarisky's group at the University of Arizona, but most importantly, it's work that makes up the PhD thesis of Ananthan Karuna Karan, who's a student at Queens who's graduating this year. So I have the pleasure of talking to you today, but what I'm presenting is just about all Ananthan's work. So with that in mind, uh, here's the outline for today's talk. I'll begin by giving you an introduction to red and blue UDGs, as well as possible formation scenarios. I'll describe why the GBT is such a great follow-up tool. And then I'll give you a preview of the Smudges H1 survey. I'll talk about our pilot survey results, the current status of the observations, and then future prospects. 
So the low surface brightness universe has long been of interest to astronomers and it's just recently, however, that the combination of new instrumentation as well as new techniques to search existing data have unlocked uh, a, a, a plethora of new observations and new objects to study. And here's an example of one of those objects. So this is Dragonfly 44 that was um, uh, detected by the Dragonfly telephoto array in its survey of the Coma cluster. And the just how extreme Dragonfly 44 is, is illustrated when you put it next to other galaxies in the local universe. And so that's what the slide on the or the picture on the right represents. So all of these galaxies are at a common physical scale of a kiloparsec. And so you can see that this object is just as faint as the Fornax dwarf spheroidal galaxy, which is above the UDG in this picture. But it's just about as big as a galaxy like M31 or M33 when you measure in terms of half light radii. So ultra diffuse galaxies are an extreme low surface brightness galaxy. They are not recently newly discovered in the last couple of years, um, but they're, they're a large number of them have been discovered and characterized with the new instrumentation and numerical techniques. So UDGs are large, faint, low surface brightness objects that have sizes similar to the Milky Way, but only a fraction of the stars. And of course, we'd like to understand how they form and how that diversity in stellar surface density arises for objects that are about the same size in the universe today. There are a number of different theoretical hypotheses for how UDGs form and evolve, but generally is the nature class. In other words, that these galaxies formed in extreme dark matter halos, and in particular, if you form them in high spin, diffuse dark matter halos, then in equilibrium, the, the baryons will settle into high spin, diffuse stellar disks. So that's the nature scenario. And then there's a broad class of models that invoke nurture of some kind. So star formation feedback, high spin interactions, or tidal encounters. In other words, but something along their evolutionary path renders their baryonic distribution very diffuse. And I'll come back to some of the, the, the nurture models a little bit later. Now, all of these models make predictions not only for red objects in clusters of galaxies like DF44 in the Coma cluster that I showed you already, but observationally there are a large number of blue diffuse objects in the field as well, and the models make predictions for their properties. So here's an observational tour of some of the blue diffuse objects that are um, that have been detected. So in the top left-hand corner are H1 contours of um, H1 selected um, diffuse objects from the alfalfa survey, and on the right hand side is a collage of different objects that have been detected in the optical by the Subaru telescope. The red objects are shown on the right hand side of that picture and the blue objects are shown on the left. And so one approach to understanding ultra diffuse galaxies is to use observations of the blue objects to inform not only their properties and evolution, but also their connection to the red objects. And that's what we're trying to do with the GBT. So it's worth taking a step back and thinking about why the GBT is such a great instrument for doing this with. Um, so first, to, to let's talk about the H1 piece first. Um, so H1 is, is a much more efficient follow-up tool for gas-rich objects to study than the stars in these, in these candidates. And the reason is that by construction, the stellar density is very low. These objects are low surface brightness, and they often have just about as much H1 or even more H1 than stars. And so it's much more efficient to target that H1 distribution distribution than it is to target the stellar distribution. And a key observable for follow-up is distances. A lot of the optically, or all of the optically selected UDG candidate catalogs are, are just that, they're candidates. And in a cluster, one can use cluster proximity as a measure of distance, but in the field that doesn't work very well. And so in order to study the physical properties of UDGs in the field, you have to know how far away they are. And H1 is a really nice way to find, to find that distance when the galaxies are gas rich. Now, among potential H1 follow-up tools, the GBT is particularly powerful. It's big and it's steerable, so that much is obvious. But it's also got, Vegas has a really nice wide band as well as a high spectral resolution. And a typical Vegas spectrum is shown here in the top right, and it extends through almost 20,000 kilometers per second. Now to zeroth order, the gas richness of these objects is independent of distance, which means we can search for galaxies at a wide range of distances along the line of sight, which makes the follow-up extremely efficient. 
Now, not only that, the GBT beam is really clean, and that's what's illustrated in the bottom right-hand corner. And that means we can do these observations at high dynamic range, and we can search for faint reservoirs next to um, massive H1-rich objects. And when you're looking particularly along such a long line of sight at a large range of distances, this is really powerful to make sure that any emission that you do detect isn't coming in through a side lobe. And so the GBT is a fabulous instrument for following up UDG candidates in the field, as well as for doing all other high dynamic range work in the local universe. And our team has used that quite a bit. So to give you an example of how efficient these kinds of observations are, so this is a, a sample that we targeted a couple of years ago um, around, so these were UDG candidates around Hicks and compact groups. There were five blue UDGs identified in that sample and we followed up all five of them in about uh, five hours total. Um, and so we were able to measure distances, gas masses and velocity widths for gas rich UDGs. To do the same thing with stars and absorption takes about a night of time on an eight meter class telescope per object. So this is an extremely efficient way to proceed with getting distances as well as uh, velocity width dynamical information. So having um, established that the GBT is both efficient and powerful for doing these kinds of measurements, we decided to undertake a large follow-up campaign. And so we're working with the SMUDGES team. So SMUDGES stands for Systematically Measuring Ultra Diffuse Galaxies. The PI is Dennis Doritsky at the University of Arizona. And the idea is to employ new search algorithms on the DESI pre-imaging data that's being publicly released to try and find ultra diffuse galaxy candidates. And if you've been staring at this image and you have a good screen, you might notice that there is a smudge in this picture. Um, the smudge is among the brightest smudges um, that we have found so far, and it's found just below this map of the DESI pre-imaging areas here. So these are the kinds of objects that we're trying to look for and characterize and ultimately follow up with the GBT. So the H1 follow-up of smudges has been the main focus of an Anthony Karuna Karen's PhD thesis. And so, so far we intend to follow up around 400 UDG candidates around coma. So far an Anthony has published results on a 70 target pilot survey. Um, and that's what's illustrated on the right-hand side of this plot. So all of the colored points are objects that Ananthan followed up. They are UDG candidates in the coma region. The red dots are points that he followed up and didn't find a detection. And the blue and the green points are detections. And once we have a detection, we have a distance, which allows us to measure a physical size from the angular size of the stellar distribution in the UDG candidate, which means we can separate true UDGs, so things that have effective radii greater than a kiloparsec and a half from foreground dwarfs. So things that are low surface brightness, but don't meet the size criterion for the UDGs. Um, and so uh, as a reminder, uh, UDGs are classified as having effective radii greater than about a kiloparsec and a half. That's an arbitrary definition and nothing I'm going to say really depends strongly on uh, the exact value of the effective radius you adopt, nor the surface brightness limit. So I'm going to tell you today about a pilot survey, which is only a small fraction of the total uh, amount of observations that we have in hand or are forthcoming. But this pilot sample is already the largest UDG optical uh, optical sorry the our largest UDG H1 follow up campaign for optically selected UDG candidates carried out so far. So there are already new things to learn. So the first thing one can do is characterize the H1 properties of these objects and compare them to that of the broader gas rich galaxy population. And that's what's done in these two panels. So the left hand side shows the distribution of velocity widths that we measure and the right hand side shows the location of these objects in the H1 mass stellar mass plane. The orange galaxies are, or the orange objects are um, confirmed UDGs in smudges. And the green and the blue show H1 selected gas rich objects that also have faint counterparts, the so called HUDs galaxies from uh, the Alfalfa survey. And so by and large, these objects are have narrow velocity widths, which suggests that at least some of them or a, a, a majority of them perhaps are low mass dwarf galaxies. And they lie in roughly the same spot in the H1 mass stellar mass plane as the rest of the gas rich galaxy population, which is shown here in, in gray and traced by alfalfa. So from the perspective of their H1 properties, these are not particularly unusual objects. 
we can push this even further and try to look for some of the correlations that have been um, that would result from some of the formation scenarios that have been proposed. And this is what Ananthan has tried to do here. Um, so the error bars are large because this is a hard measurement to make, um, but the y axis shows gas richness, so the ratio of H1 mass to stellar mass, and the x axis shows the effective radius of the stellar distribution. And the vertical line on this plot is the dividing line between UDGs on the right, so that have large effective radii and foreground dwarfs on the left that have smaller effective radii. And moreover, Ananthan has colored these points um, for, for different ranges of stellar mass. So objects in a given stellar mass bin have a certain color. And the idea here is that if you look at the UDGs, you can start to see hints of a correlation emerging between the gas richness of the object and the size of the stellar disk, whereas that correlation doesn't appear to be present for the foreground dwarfs. And this is a prediction of some of the nurture models, in particular the bursty star formation model. So the idea is that if there if um, bursts of star formation at relatively high redshift non-adiabatically expand the underlying dark matter halo, then the stars and the gas are going to settle in a larger disk as a result of that bursty star formation um, than would otherwise have occurred. And because star formation is tied, the, the prevalence of star formation is tied to the size of the gas reservoir, then a correlation between gas richness and size emerges. So this may be a hint that some of these nurture models and the bursty star formation model in particular may be at work for some of these systems, but um, it's still unclear how unique that prediction is and whether it is uh, shared by other models or whether there are other mechanisms that were, are at work for some of these objects as well. So where to go from here? Um, everything I've described today pertains to those small green points in the, uh, the right hand side of this plot. So we've only looked carefully at the pilot survey data so far. We have almost 200 objects observed that are in hand right now. And that's what's shown by the blue the, and the red points in this diagram. And uh, on top of that, we've been allocated time to observe the cyan and the pink galaxies. Um, and so altogether, we should have about 400 objects that we followed up. It would be by far and away the largest H1 uh, follow-up campaign of optically selected UDGs. And based on our current estimations, we expect to find 50 bona fide UDGs among this sample that will allow us to homogeneously examine predictions from theoretical models, as well as be quantitative about some of the trends that I've described today. So to conclude, theoretical models for UDG formation predict the properties of diffuse blue and red field dwarfs. And the GBT is a superb instrument for efficient H1 follow-up of optically selected field UDG candidates, so candidates with gas reservoirs. And that tells us something not only about the diffuse blue objects, but also about the, the relationship between those blue objects and the red ones in clusters. So um, Ananthan has undertaken or is in the middle of a, a large survey called Smudges H1. The pilot survey data already suggests uh, a correlation between the size and the gas richness of the objects. That's the first time that that correlation has been reported. And with the full survey, we should be able to um, carry out quantitative uh, comparisons um, as well as subdivide the sample between um, more finely according to different galaxy properties to try and understand the origin of these ultra diffuse galaxies. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I see that we have a few questions and um, I'll just read them as they come in. Um, how will the future high resolution instruments like NGVLA help with the study of ultra diffuse galaxies? Kind of an open-ended question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I will, um, the, the name of the game right now, or one important follow-up um, uh, path is to spatially resolve um, the, uh, the, 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 the star formation as well as the kinematics of these objects. Um, and so for the NGVLA, one could try to use the gas um, as a tracer of the resolve properties of those objects. Um, there is a lot of work being done right now in spatially resolving these objects in, in H1, um, which uh, not only the NGVLA, but the SKA as well as the pathfinders are starting to do now. Um, available, it's very hard going with available instruments because you really need 
you need enough spatial resolution to disentangle geometric effects from uh, rotation effects. And, and it's all the current observations are right at the cusp of being able to do that. But spatially resolving the properties of these objects is uh, the next logical step. Um, we're going after statistics with the GBT, but some of the, the, the um, there are some objects in the sample that are, are well suited to high resolution follow up. And so that's where we're going next. We actually have a program on Meerkat to do just that. Okay. Another question. Uh, could it be that the narrow line widths observed are a selection effect rather than truly reflecting low masses, as by selecting low surface brightness objects slash disks, these objects will preferably be face on and thus have narrow line widths? Yes. The selection effects are brutal um, and they are, you do preferentially select in fact, in all, whether you're selecting in H1 or whether you're selecting in the optical, you are preferentially selecting face on objects. Um, there are other lines of evidence that suggest that at least the that the bulk of the UDG population are made up of dwarf type things. There are some objects that may well be large, um, that, that may be high mass objects. Um, and there may also be objects that started as high mass objects and then wound up as um, relatively low mass things in clusters as a result of um, uh, as a result of their their interactions with the cluster potential. Um, so yes, a lot of these objects by construction are face on that may that also makes them very difficult to follow up, at least in terms of kinematics. Um, so I um, drawing that a, a straight line between uh, the width that you measure and the, the the mass of the object is is not straightforward. And so I, I, I think I tried to hedge a little bit. I don't think I, I claim that they were all dwarfs, but um, there is some evidence that suggests that a lot of them are. Okay, a technical question. How long was your integration time and did you have any sight lines with more than one detection? Um, so the, so the, the total time on source is about an hour. Um, somewhere between an hour and two hours, if you count uh, both the on and the off. Um, the integration time, I, if you're talking about the dump time, I think we dumped every five seconds or something like that. Um, we have not yet detected two things along the same line of sight, or um, certainly not two things that were possibly UDG candidates. So the, the space density of these things is relatively low. It's maybe um, one or so per square degree. Um, and so the chance that one gets multiple um, viable UDG um, detections along the same line of sight is extremely small. Okay. Um, is the signal to noise ratio of the profiles sufficient to study the H1 profile shapes? The question about double horned and so on. It's, um, yeah, it's borderline. Um, it depends on the source. There are, for some of the brighter sources, there are hints of a double profile, but usually we're in the signal to noise regime where we're smoothing um, to, we are sacrificing um, spectral resolution for signal to noise. Generally speaking, and consistent with dwarfy things or face on things, we found we find Gaussian like profiles. Um, and the widths are sort of of order tens of kilometers per second, somewhere between 15 and 30 kilometers per second. Do you see any difference in the um, REFF dash mass of H1 scaling relation in different environments? For example, COBA versus the field. Um, so we there are no gas rich UDGs in coma, um, and we don't yet have the statistics to look around coma versus somewhere else. Um, we may be able to start to play that game once we have the full smudges H1 survey. So right now the answer is no, um, and uh, I we. I, we don't yet have enough objects to even be quantitative about that relationship. The error bars are still pretty big. Um, that would be something that would be great to look for. Uh, we may well just get there with Smudges H1, but it's it's tough going. Okay, we have we have time for two more questions, and we have two more. Um, nice talk. Thanks so much, Christine. You said that 20 out of 70 of the UDG or candidates were confirmed by the GBT. What are the other 50? Are they simply undetected in H1? If so, couldn't they be UDGs in coma that are stripped of H1? Yeah, so they're probably, they, well, so what we do know is that wherever, whatever they are, wherever they are, they're gas poor. Um, it's, they're far enough away from coma um, that they, it, it's unclear um, where exactly they are. Um, I think a, a major outstanding question is how, what the frequency of gas poor UDGs in the field is. Um, and that's an extremely difficult question to answer. Um, 
So the other 50 are, are gas poor objects. They're somewhere along, somewhere along the line of sight. They may well be associated with coma. Um, they're, they're established as UDG candidates at the coma distance. Um, and so if they were at that distance, they would be gas poor UDGs. Um, and we've been trying to push our observing efficiency up by um, trying to understand which objects in the optical are likely to have H1 counterparts. And at these really low surface brightnesses, it's hard to use just color to do that. So we're finding that a combination of color and irregular morphology is a nice, com and combined with uh, UV emission, if there is deep UV emission at that location, is a nice predictor of gas richness. So we're hoping our, we expect our efficiency to go up moving forward. Let me combine two more questions because one just came in and, uh, and bring this uh, seminar to an end. Uh, what are the differences between red and blue UDGs beyond their color and location? And is there a prospect to construct a Tully-Fisher relationship for these objects? Um, so one could certainly begin to put these, uh, the, the um, so yes, you could put these objects on a Tully-Fisher relation if you had a good sense of their distance. So for the blue objects, that's fairly straightforward. Um, you could put these objects on a baryonic Tully-Fisher relation um, if they've been detected in, in H1 as well. Um, as for the differences between the blue and the red UDGs, that's an outstanding question. Um, it could be that the red UDGs are blue UDGs that have been thrown into clusters. When they entered the cluster will um, affect the relationship between the blue diffuse objects that we see today and whatever the red objects were at the time that they fell into the cluster. Um, it's possible as well that those objects were um, uh, stripped of their gas extremely early and so therefore the, the the relationship between the blue UDGs and the red UDGs is more tenuous. Um, either way, if one can constrain the properties of the blue UDGs, then um, that provides us quantitative measures against which the models uh, have to work or have to reproduce in order to, to understand the two. But all of the formation models I've, I've mentioned do predict the existence of blue things in the field. It's just the relationship between the blue things and the red things that varies depending on the model. Thanks very much. Um, and I'd just like to remind everybody that the recording of this uh, session will be on the GBO website in a couple of days. And stay tuned. Two weeks from now, we have Charles Romero talking about insights into intracluster gas in clusters of galaxies from the Mustang II three millimeter bolometer survey. So thanks very much again, and we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. <laughs>